Okay, so welcome back and we will continue with our discussion on flip chip bonding process. Uh, you recall that in the last lecture we had discussed, we had started the process of flip chip bonding. The first step as we saw in flip chip bonding was to was called the bumping of the die and we discussed that and today we will take off from there. So, let us first recap a little bit the con over here this was the bumping process as you can see right. The bumping process again was a two step process the first one was under bump metallization as we saw here where the aluminum connection pad was coated with a metallic layer and typically this is done if you recall by a sputter process a dry sputter process or an enig which is called electroless nickel gold immersion. Okay. So, here in this case we write sputter so this was a, which is which is the most common method and thereafter the next step was to form this this uh, solder ball or the solder bump and for that what is done is we first use a photo mask made of photoresist material. So, that what happens is just the location where I need to deposit the solder ball is exposed as is shown there. Okay. Thereafter electroplating is done by which the solder is kind of deposited and thereafter the photoresist is removed. Okay. So, photoresist is not required so we remove that and then we also do not need the UBM layer which was under the photoresist correct because the UBM was required to form the connection to facilitate the connection of the solder to the aluminum connection pad on the silicon. So, therefore, so that unnecessary UBM layer is also etched away and finally, the solder is just reflowed in a dry oven. So, that it just melts for a short period of time and takes the shape of a solder of, of a ball or a bump using the due to the surface energy minimization. Okay. If you look at the right hand side, so this is these are the different layers that we talked about. The silicon which is the die followed by the aluminum connection pad followed by the UBM layer and then finally, the solder bump. Okay. So, now therefore, after this process I have a piece of silicon with an array of these solder bumps, okay, but that is not enough. So, that is still on the die side. I need to now put it on the package which will provide me the connections to the other components or to the motherboard. So, in order to do that recall flip chip what we will do is the next one step is called attachment to the substrate. Okay. So, the first step is the solder balls which were deposited on top is inverted upside down flipped upside down the name flip chip comes from there and then you have the substrate with corresponding landing pads or connection pads. So, the silicon is perfectly aligned with the substrate. So, that when it comes down the solder balls align and land right on top of its corresponding connection pad on the substrate which is shown here. Okay. Now, recall again I want to mention here that if you go back to the last lecture we talked about tape automated bonding. This process is quite common there I and mean, this is the process where this where the silicon is flipped over and put at the connection region of the tape automated bonding process or on the film or the tape on which this connecting connection traces were there. Okay. So, this process is the same except now this is the this is the substrate on which the solder balls come and land. Now, this is not enough even though they are now just lightly touching each other this is not good enough for the electrical connections I need to do better. So, next what is done is what we call the reflow of the solder solder is reflowed what does it mean reflow of the solder means that the solder which had solidified before is again 
converted to the fluid state where it can flow a bit. How is this done? So, again this is done in what is called a reflow oven soldering reflow soldering process. So, it is a hot air oven where this you know this bumped die sitting on the substrate is passed through this oven where what happens is the solder again there is and again when it passes through this oven the time temperature characteristic of this oven is very important. Okay. So, this bumped die on the substrate should remain inside the oven just that long so that the solder balls just melts and forms a connection and as it comes out as the solder as when it comes out the solder again solidifies back. Okay. So, therefore, what happens is the final structure is not a perfect you know spheri spherical contact or a point contact, but it is kind of a surface contact. So, it is kind of a flattened at the, the sphere the solder ball is flattened where the connection is made and that ensures better impedance less or rather lesser impedance and lesser inductance. Okay. So, this reflow oven reflow process is very important the especially the time temperature characteristic. See if it is heated for a, or it, if it is kept inside for a longer time what will happen? The molten solder will, will flow and will connect with the neighboring solder pad and then there will be all kinds of short circuits shorting of these points we do not want that. Okay. But at the other hand if it is there for too less that it does not melt and you do not have a wetted joint that is the problem as well. Okay, That is number 1. Number 2 is that is about the time and the temperature you, may, you want to heat it to a, to a point where it just melts you do not want to really heat it very hard very high. So, that it, it, it melts immediately as it goes and neither do you want it to be so low that it does not even melt it does not have enough fluidity. Okay. And there is another thing that a solder flux is also deposited is also used rather and this flux helps see number 1 or rather prevents the formation of sol of oxide and as well as ensures perfect wetting. Okay. Solder flux is required even when you do this you know soldering iron that we do on the on our lab table tops there also you use the flux. Right. So, the solder flux is important I think we all know why that is important. So, but I just want to mention that here also in this process as well it is a soldering process. So, therefore, the flux is or will be required. Okay. So, therefore, now let us just recap this picture that we saw about two lectures back of the flip chip process. Okay and just go, th go through this in our minds and see that have we looked into all this. Step 1 you had the silicon with the connection pads and today and, and day before we and, and to, rather today and the lecture before we discussed and we came to know that most of these connection pads on the silicon are aluminum and sometimes copper. Okay? So, this aluminum cannot be used for you know putting the connection of the solder balls and that is why you need under bump metallization followed by what we call the bumping of the die. So, that is step number 2. The second figure is after the die has been bumped. Figure 3, 4, 5 and 6 is the attachment to the substrate process where the die is first flipped over then aligned perfectly with the substrate. So, that the landing pads the connection pads and the solder balls perfectly align and connect with each other. And then now this is still a point contact right yeah they are just touching each other where it is supposed to, but that is not good enough you need a better contact. So, in order to do that it is passed through a reflow oven where the solder melts just adequately. So, that the connect junction is wetted 
and then it solidifies. So, now I have a better connection. So, if I again try to sorry ok. So, I was trying to draw something, but it looks like it is not possible here. So, now uh, what we are going to do is we will go to the third step of the flip chip bonding process. Step on one was bumping of the die, step number two was attachment to the substrate, we covered those. Now, this one is step number three and which is known as the epoxy underfill. Okay. Now, what is epoxy underfill? It is a needle dispensed along okay. underfill is actually an epoxy which will go you see the spaces in between the solder balls. Okay. So, here the epoxy underfill will go and fill up all these spaces in this ball grid array. Okay. So, wherever whatever is the void or the space between two adjacent solder balls, it is going to be filled up not by air which is what it is now, but that air is going to be displaced by an epoxy. Okay. Now, let us understand why. So, why is the underfill required which is what I am showing in the bottom half of this slide. The most important reason is as follows, think about it. The substrate is a different material compared to silicon which is the dye. Right? Now, what we are saying is we are going to take this assembly what we see over here and put it in a in a system. Okay. So, this is your semiconductor package, the microprocessor package that goes into your computer. Now, when you are using the computer or when you are using this electronic product, what happens? The product is going to be powered on, the product is going to be powered off. Okay. When it is powered on because of the current flowing through these various uh, circuits, there will be heat that is generated due to joule heating I squared R and as a result of which the temperature will go up. Okay. Now, as the temperature goes up what happens? Most materials expand, right? a material typically expands when it is heated. Now, to what extent? Material expands to the extent which is defined by its coefficient of thermal expansion. Okay. If you have a certain length L and you heat it up by a temperature delta T, then we know that the final length becomes L times 1 plus alpha delta T, where alpha is a coefficient of thermal expansion. To be more correct coefficient of linear thermal expansion, because we are talking about a one length. Right. So, now the problem is what you have on top is silicon, what you have on bottom is a substrate which can be an organic substrate like an FR4, it can be a ceramic substrate, it can be some other material. But the problem is that the coefficient of thermal expansion of these two are going to be different. So, what does it mean? Therefore, it means that when it is heated up the silicon and the substrate are going to have different coefficients of or sorry the silicon and substrate due to their different coefficients of thermal expansion are going to expand differentially one will expand more than the other. And this is going to rise give rise to a lot of stresses. whether it is compressive or shear, sorry rather shear stresses whether it is inward or outward on the solder balls. 
okay and this can lead to failure of the solder joints with time okay so this differential expansion between the chip and the substrate has to be arrested and therefore in order to do that what is done is this epoxy material is injected or introduced into the spacing between the solder balls all right so that is one of the main reasons of underfill using epoxy underfill this is used to compensate for any thermal expansion difference between the chip and the substrate so typically the epoxy will have a coefficient thermal expansion that lies between the chip and the substrate the epoxy is chosen that way and in mechanically locks together the chip and sub the, the substrate so the differences in thermal expansion do not break or damage the electrical connection of the bumps okay it will itself take up a lot of these stresses that is induced because of this differential expansion so that is a very very major function that the underfill epoxy performs it's extremely extremely critical from the point of view of reliability so that is why remember when we started talking about flip chip we were repeatedly seeing the occurrence of underfill epoxy and we kept on saying that yeah we will come back to this we'll come back to this this is important but as you can see that it is it is so important okay so that's the major reason why epoxy underfill is required now it has some other as well other other uses or or benefits as well it protects the bumps from moisture and or other in environmental hazards so now if if i go back to the previous picture again these solder bumps are now subjected to atmosphere atmospheric moisture uh, subjected to corrosion if it is you know exposed let's say to hot and harsh environments okay in military applications avionics okay so in such deep sea deep sea drilling so in such cases protecting the solder walls from the environmental uh, environmental environmental conditions is important and the underfill epoxy does that okay and the third one is when the epoxy dries up it forms a very rigid structure and gives therefore gives mechanical strength and rigidity to this package okay this whole assembly of the chip solder balls and the substrate this entire package that we have it gets a lot of mechanical strength because of this underfill epoxy you recall um, let us say um, your dendrite or araldite that we use as epoxy in our household uh, if you harden it what happens it becomes really stone hard once it is cured it re re becomes really hard so this is that type of an epoxy okay similarly this underfill epoxy also once it is cured it is like almost a very hard hard structure and that gives this package a lot of mechanical strength and rigidity okay so from reliability point of view in terms of protecting the solder joints from failure due to differential expansion that being its major function it also protects the solder balls from environmental factors and as well as it provides additional mechanical strength to this entire assembly so therefore underfill epoxy is very very important so what are the steps you look at this picture so somehow if you put this epoxy it will go through and you know fill up the void spaces between the solder balls and finally it will give you the structure and as you can see over here uh, i don't know how how uh, visible it is on the screen but as you will see that there's a little bit of transparency in this epoxy inside you can see the solder ball on the connection pads and the epoxy is protecting all of them okay 
So, how do we do this epoxy? That is the next question. Okay. So, this underfill epoxy, the flow of this underfill epoxy, this topic itself has been a subject of research for many, many years. Okay. Okay, once again, I want to mention, I think I, I mentioned it in the introductory lectures. Electronic packaging is such a vast multidisciplinary field that each of these concepts that we are talking about, under bump metallization, pumping method, underfill epoxy, even going back wire bonding, later on we will see uh, many other concepts when we talk about motherboard, the second level packaging. See, there are groups of researchers who have spent their entire careers studying one of these topics. There is so much of richness in each of these. So, this underfill epoxy, how will you, these are pictures from the textbook from Professor Rao Tumala. Uh, what do we see here? The epoxy can be dispensed in three means by three methods, primarily by three methods. The first one, first one and the first and the second one, these are both, uh, you know, the last process after the bumped die has been attached to the substrate. Uh, we have the first two process. The first one is called capillary flow. So, which is similar to what I was showing in this schematic, where you put the epoxy on one side and at that point of course, it is in the liquid state and what happens is the epoxy just due to capillary action because of surface tension forces is going to go through and fill up all the voids. Okay. So, that is what we are calling capillary flow. There is an underfill epoxy reservoir at some pressure and then because of surface tension, surface tension driven flow, the epoxy is just seeping in into the space between the chip and the substrate okay. and slowly it will just seep in and fill up all these voids. Okay. So, that is how it is done. Now, the second one is if the capillary flow and the capillary uh, pressure drive driver is not enough. The capillary forces are not enough to let this epoxy flow from one end of the die to the other. In such a case, we use what is called an injection flow. So, you will have to take a needle with a syringe and then dispense it through the needle, so that the epoxy now has got some initial momentum to flow through this gap and fill up all these voids. Okay. If it just happens by capillary good enough, but if it does not happen then you have to use some additional, it is no longer a passive driven flow, you have to use some additional external energy. You have to do some work done on, on the system, you have to do some work on the system or get some work done on the system and you what you the one of the ways that it is done is using a syringe with a needle which is used to dispense this epoxy. So, the epoxy actually comes out with an initial velocity and momentum and can therefore, travel through this uh, space between the substrate and the chip and in the space in between the solder ball array and fill up the voids. Okay. And the third one is known as compression flow. Okay. This is also known as something called no flow underfill. So, what is that? This for a change is not the final process. So, earlier we were talking about pumping of the die, attachment to the substrate, underfill 1, 2, 3. But here the two, the process 2 and 3 which is attachment of the bumped die to the substrate and the underfill happens simultaneously. How? The way it is done is first you put this epoxy and then you compress it. Okay. Then you bring the chip, the bumped chip on the substrate. So, as the as you can see in this picture, as the chip comes down, it kind of displaces the epoxy and to, to move towards the edges and finally goes and forms the bond. Okay. Now, you must keep in mind however, that this however, runs a risk of having 
a little bit of this epoxy material which is non conducting electrically non conducting to stick between the solder ball and the connection pad on the substrate. Okay. So, this must be taken in keep kept in mind and so the, uh, the underfill material has to be chosen with the right viscosity, right density and surface tension such that as the chip comes in and settles on the substrate with a little bit of force uh, it is able to displace the entire epoxy and there is no layer even a thin layer of epoxy that stays between the solder ball and the pad and thereby you know um, breaks the electrical connection between the two. Okay. All right. So, this is uh, this compressible compression flow is another method where as we said the attachment to the substrate and the underfill epoxy happens simultaneously. Okay. But however, in all these cases what we are saying is the underfill has a very major role we talked about some of them. Okay. However, there is a fourth function which typically you should not be requiring if your ball grid array process is very good. But still the fourth function is in case there is any issue it clearly you know disconnects the adjacent electrically disconnects or the adjacent solder balls. So, that even by mistake there is no short circuit between them. Okay. So, the underfill right now if you think about it it is filling up this space between let us say this solder ball and the next one. So, let us say by any means it gets heated the solder melt somehow whatever it is uh, there will be no short circuit between these two because the epoxy after getting cured and hardened is going to prevent that just in case okay, just to think it normally does not happen if your ball grid array process is good enough and designed well enough it should not happen, but just in case if it happens the epoxy will come in the way. Okay. But the major three uh, functions of epoxy remains the most important one is reducing the differential expansion due to temperature rise. Number two is protecting the solder balls from environmental factors like moisture and number three giving mechanical rigidity to this entire assembly. All right. okay. So, that kind of uh, brings us to the end of flip chip technology it is I would once again repeat that it is one of the most significant advances or inventions in the history of electronic packaging. Okay. The three steps that we talked about. Uh, it is actually bumping of the die not UBM, UBM is again part of bumping of the die. So, it is bumping of the die then attachment to the substrate and finally, under fill epoxy okay. and we discussed about all of them in especially uh, the second and third processes in quite a bit of detail in this lecture. Okay. And that my friends also brings us to the end of first level packaging. Let us just summarize the topics that we discussed under first level packaging. Of course, we started with the most basic definition of what is a chip, what is a chip carrier and, and so on and so forth and then that led us to interconnect technologies. What are the different types of leads? Okay. Leads, the wires so on and so forth. Then we looked at types of packages. We said that it can be you can classify packages by various means. First is by through materials ceramic, plastic, organic. Second interconnect types. <coughs> where we talked about the leads all right and and we talked about different kinds of leads you know through hole pin in hole uh, surface mount and surface mount we are using this j leads gullwing leads uh, so on and so forth okay and then we talked about area array packages we started with pin grid array we talked about ball grid array we also talked about land grid array okay so that was looking at different kinds of packages and then we looked at the manufacturing processes starting with wire bonding, then tape automated bonding and finally, flip chip bonding. Okay. So, now what do we have? We have a silicon, we have a good knowledge after all these discussions on first level packaging, we ended up with we are we have ended up with a piece of silicon with all the circuitry and now connected to a substrate electrically connected and functionally connected to a substrate. 
this substrate eventually is now going to lead to the next level where it is going to go to the motherboard. But then also keep in mind that the flip chip interconnect technology also enables you to get rid of this substrate completely and bond the silicon die directly on the motherboard which is also known as chip on board. Okay. That is also first level packaging except that the substrate is not there. Okay. So, when we come back in the next lecture or the in probably the next couple of weeks uh, or next one week at least, uh, we are going to talk about what is um, second level packaging. Okay. Thank you very much and till the next lecture have a good one. Thank you.